was 12 years old, I was on stage at Unqua Elementary School, Massapequa, Long Island. It was my sixth grade play. And when it came time for me to say my lines, I just froze what seemed like 30 minutes to me. Finally, I skipped over it. Thank God. And no one remembered those 15 or 20 seconds, except for me, for the next 40 years. What's your biggest fear? Think about it. What are you most afraid of? Write it down. Napoleon Hill, in my favorite book, apologies, my second favorite book now, <laughs> Think and Grow Rich, enumerates humans' six biggest fears. Fear of criticism, fear of ill health, fear of old age, fear of the loss of someone you love, fear of poverty, and fear of death. I will tell you, Napoleon Hill completely misses one essential fear. My biggest fear, up until a little over two years ago, fear of public speaking. In fact, if you ask me to speak in front of more than two people, I got out my index cards. There was no way I was gonna freeze again. Let's fast forward to January 2000. I'm living and working in Switzerland for a company called Swiss Reinsurance Company. And my boss comes up to me and she says, Joel, you had a really good year last year. For a reward, I'm gonna have you speak in front of the Swiss Re New Markets offsite meeting in Schrunz, Austria. A reward? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I got prepared, got out my index cards, and I wrote down every single word I was going to say. And then, on January 20th, 2000, I stood in front of 400 managing directors and the president of the Swiss Reno Markets Division, and I read my speech. And I remember looking up once <laughs> and seeing in the second row the president and one of the senior managing directors with their heads down. But that didn't deter me. Between 2008 and 2016, working as a hedge fund manager, first at Citigroup and then my own fund, more capital. I was asked many times to give my best stock idea at a lunch or a dinner. I got prepared. I got out my index cards and I wrote down every single word I was going to say of that stock idea. And then I went to the lunch or dinner and all those analysts and portfolio managers who were there winged it. And it got to me, and I read every single word of that stock pitch, hoping that my colleagues, analysts, and other portfolio managers in the room weren't having their face in the chocolate cake or ice cream. Let me tell you a story. Fast forward again to July 2016. I'm on the phone with a health coach, a health coach good friend of mine, picking a brain as it were, because I had made a big decision to shut down my hedge fund, to become a prosperity coach, to help people become financially free so they don't have to worry if they don't want to. So that's what I'm doing. I'm teaching people the basics of personal finance, credit cards, what's your credit score, what's your financial freedom number, how do you get there, quick. How do you invest? What's a stock or a bond, a currency or a commodity? 
But most importantly, as Mike mentioned, I talk about money mindset. What's stopping you from becoming financially free? What's your intuition? What are your beliefs around money? What are those limiting beliefs and how to shift them to empowering beliefs? So I'm on with the phone with Kiersey, picking a brain as it were. But you may ask, why did I shut down my hedge fund? Well, let me give you two reasons. In December 2015, I'm at a conference. And two things happened there that changed my life. One was, there was a guy, guest speaker, speaking about stocks and stock options. And when he started speaking about stock options, it was like it was a get-rich-quick scheme. You don't need much time. You don't need much money. This is how the rich people got rich. And options are essentially riskless. I was sick to my stomach. This was day two of the conference. People were tapping me on the shoulder, whispering, me, Joel, does this make sense? So after the guy was done, walked outside, I said, please don't do this. This guy has no idea about your earnings, your assets, your cash flow, your risk tolerance, your tax status, and most importantly, has no idea about your education on stock options and your belief that you can make money in stock options. Now the second thing that happened at the course was we were to do an exercise called obstacles or illusions. And we were given a wooden board to stick. We were told we were gonna break the board with our bare hand. Anybody ever do this? Awesome. We had 45 minutes of training. We had to fill out a permission slip listing next of kin. There was a lot of fear in that room. So on one side of the board, we had to write our biggest obstacle. And I wrote down, raising enough money for Solomon Capital for it to be massively profitable, a long-term viable entity. And on the other side, I wrote my ultimate goal in green, to help everybody in this room become financially free. And then I broke that board like the other 200 people in that room. And I went home that night and I couldn't sleep. The wooden board was staring back at me. Actually, half the wooden board was staring back at me, making everybody in this room financially free. And I realized it was a non sequitur. What did raising more money from my hedge fund have anything to do with helping the people in that room? And then, as 3 o'clock became 4 o'clock and 4 o'clock became 5 a.m., the other thing that hit me was I could do a better job than that guy who is at the very least being misleading to these people, and some may say lying to them. If I could ever get up the courage to speak in front of 200 people, I would be much more authentic than he was. So, I went in to Manhattan. My office was on 54th and 6th, and I sent an email to my investors telling them I'm giving them their money back. I'm shutting down my fund because I found my true purpose. And I know it may sound like a cliche, but it's true. So I'm on the phone with Kiersey. I made a big decision to become a prosperity coach. And at the end of the conversation, I realized that this conversation is a life-changing event in its own right. Because at the end of the conversation, Kiersey says to me, Joel, Will I see you in October? Why, Kiersey? She says, because playing the Matrix is coming to New York. I said, playing what? She said, Joel, you don't get the note from the universe? You don't know Mike Dooley? I don't. So Kiersey explains to me all about Mike Dooley. He's a motivational speaker. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Infinite Possibilities. And that note from the universe goes out to 800,000 people globally. Okay, maybe I'll go. So I go in October 2016 to the Playing the Matrix conference at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, not too far from here. And a few things happened at that conference 
that I call synchronicities because I don't believe in coincidences. So Mike starts talking about his background. And he started his career as an accountant. And you heard from Mike that I started my career as an actuary. And you guys know the difference between an actuary and an accountant, right? An actuary looks at his feet when he talks to you. An accountant looks at your feet when they talk to you. <laughs> They say an accountant is an actuary with charisma. You heard the one about the two actuaries? They go moose hunting. They get the camouflage gear on. They get their rifles all set up. And the first actuary spies a moose. He says, I got him, I got him. And he shoots and he misses five feet to the left. And the second actuary says, no, 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 I got him, I got him. And he shoots and he misses five feet to the right. They give each other a high five and say, on average, we got them. <laughs> and then there was the woman. She goes to the doctor. The doctor says, I got some really bad news. I got six months to live. She says, Doc, is there anything I can do? Any ideas you have? So he thinks, and he thinks, and he thinks some more, and he says, I got one idea for you. Move to North Dakota and marry an actuary. Why would I do that, she says. And he says, because it'll be the longest six months of your life. <laughs> okay, I'm not the typical actuary. <laughs> but the synchronic synchronicities continued when I was at that conference because Mike starts talking about infinite possibilities, his New York Times bestselling book. And he says that chapter one I hadn't done any research. I knew nothing about him except those three facts. And he says chapter one is called Thoughts Become Things. And I got chills. Because my email signature from the day I started my hedge fund, it said Joel Solomon, email, cell phone number. And at the bottom it said, Thoughts Are Things, from my second favorite book, Thinking of Rich by Napoleon Hill. In fact, it's the first three words, as you know, of that book, Thoughts Are Things. And then there was a third synchronicity. Mike starts talking about The Secret. Anybody ever read The Secret? Anybody? Two people, okay. So Mike starts talking about The Secret and how it changed his life because when he first wrote Infinite Possibilities, it self-published. And then he was in the book, The Secret, saying, thoughts become things. And it changed his life, and Infinite Possibilities became a bestseller, and so on. And The Secret changed my life, too. So I read The Secret in February 2008. And it had this passage in there about this guy who thought about this feather. And every morning he walked up, woke up, he thought about the feather. And every night before he went to sleep, he thought about this feather day after day. And then one day, he's walking down the street. And he looks down on the sidewalk, and he sees the feather that he'd been thinking about in his mind. And then they say, you try it. So I don't know why, but the first thing that popped into my head was cotton balls. I don't know why. Pure white cotton balls, right? So every morning, February 2008, started thinking about cotton balls. Every night before I went to sleep, thought about cotton balls, day after day. Well, in April of 2008, it got warm enough, I started to go jogging with my daughters, Lauren and Morgan. They were two and four at the time. So I would jog, they would sit in the double jogging stroller, actually. And we'd go to this track, and I'd run around the track and field for a couple of rounds, maybe three laps. And then we'd get to this park, and we'd get to the hill, and I'd run up the hill, and we'd get to the playground, and I'd get my break. I'd get them out of the double jogging stroller, I'd push them on the swings, I'd push them down the slide, and then they'd get back in, and I'd jog home. Well, it was May 31st, 2008. Ran around that track a few times. We got to the park, I ran up the hill, and I'm getting them out of the double jogging stroller. And I looked, and all over the parade playground were not just one, not just two, but tons of cockles. If 
thought had become a thing. And then it said in the secret, print out a check from their website, which I did on June 1st, 2008, and put it on the ceiling above your bed, which I did, after I'd written out, paid the order of Joel Solomon, multiples of what I'd ever made in my life. And it said, from the Gratitude Bank of the Universe, which gratitude, by the way, is one of the nine money rules that millionaires use, which is the title of my upcoming book. It's actually rule number five, gratitude. We'll get into that later. So I put that check on the ceiling above my bed on June 1st, 2008, and I said, I don't know how, I don't know why, but the same energy that creates cotton balls creates money. And so every day, I woke up, I don't know how, I don't know why, and every night before I went to sleep, I don't know how, I don't know why, do you know what's coming? Well, you guys may remember 2008, it's not the best year in the stock market. I'm managing money for Citigroup as a hedge fund manager. Market was down 40%. Financial stocks, which is the only sector I was managing, was down 57%. We made a little bit of money. Nowhere near the amount on the ceiling. 